morning and welcome to Thoughts and Updates. I am here in the shadow of St Martin's Church and just there is what uh, I was told was St Martin's tomb, which is not. It is a family tomb which um, was <coughs> the Lennox Kinnaird families. There are two stones on it which uh, close it off. Both of which are reference to the early 17th century when the death of a James Kinnaird at 1604, one of a death of a James Kinnaird in 1606. And I thought they must be mistaken, but or the same people, but they're not. Um, and what's interesting is, of course, with the ruins that are there of the kirk, that <coughs> I've gone from being in car parks now into graveyards. Um, that was an anteroom at one point, although it was a tomb for the Kinnaird families. The lady of the time in the 19th century used it as a waiting room when going to the kirk um, or going to the church. Uh, the exact denomination of St Mackins, um, I presume, is Catholic uh, because it is a saint, whereas as heathens in the Prodi church tended to have more prosaic names. Um, and invoke less of the sainthood. Uh, we were also learning uh, yesterday in St Andrews uh, up at the cathedral there and saw the sarcophagus in which some of the relics of St Andrews it's believed were brought from Greece when a cleric was visited by an angel to tell him that the um, relics of St Andrews time the apostle from uh, Jesus uh, were being moved to Constantinople and he was moved by the spirit to take them across Europe um, to uh, where he rested in St Andrews and hence the name up to that point, I think it was the 8th century, St Andrews was called something else um, and that's where we got a patron saint but here uh, just along from Lennox town we have St Martin's graveyard with the tomb that's there, a family tomb of the Canaries and Lennoxes and the light's just gone out so it is early in the morning but not too early. Uh, because it is dawn in uh, Scotland. Uh, here, um, it is perhaps an appropriate place, a family tomb and a graveyard, a couple of things for this morning uh, that I've had to muse a lot on. A uh, graveyard, let's talk the Labour Party. Um, somebody said to me recently that they thought the Labour Party in Scotland was finished. And I thought, you know, maybe that's true. But we thought the Tory party in Scotland was finished and they had a renaissance under Ruth Davidson. And I was glad to see that there was a renaissance for the Conservative Party simply because I'm a Democrat. I believe in democracy. I believe that any single party state is unhealthy. So do I believe that the yellow across the whole of Scotland that shows that the SNP have 48 MS MPs is unhealthy? To an extent I do because it demonstrates the unhealthy nature of a first-past-the-post electoral system. I understand in certain areas in the United Kingdom that first-past-the-post works exceptionally well because they have very good MPs. I'm not one of these people who think that uh, members of Parliament are noses in the trough all the time, absolutely, totally and utterly corrupt. I think that we get the politicians we deserve and there are many out of the 650 politicians in Westminster that I've got a great degree of respect for. And if you think of titans of the past, your Hesseltines, your Bens and so on on either side, then, yeah, we did have really good quality politicians and we do have again. But the Labour Party has a significant issue. One, it's unelectable. As it stands at the moment, both in Scotland and down south, it's unelectable. Corbyn did not prove a hit. Somebody said in a program, I think it was uh, a review of the year for Have I Got News For You, is it time now to blame Jeremy Corbyn on behalf of the millions of people who've been left in poverty for leaving them there and condemning us to austerity because he was unable to take what was a buffoon-led government and turn it into some kind of uh, electable uh, grouping, uh, the Labour Party into an electable grouping and take away from the Tories their opportunity for the next five, maybe ten years. Perhaps it is. Perhaps Tony Blair, who wasn't the greatest Prime Minister, who wasn't the best politician in the world, was the best politician in the world because he understood in order to bring the Labour Party to power meant he was bringing some kind of sense to the country and therefore certain compromises had to be made. 
I don't know. I hope the Labour Party don't die because we in the United Kingdom owe them a great deal and should be grateful that they were there. Them, the Liberals in the 19th and the 20th century gave us a welfare state, shone a light upon the conditions of the working poor and we should be grateful for that. However, they now have to learn where they went wrong. Sporting, it's a time of reflection. I know it's been New Year and indeed uh, Christmas because Martin Lissis is the world's strongest man for 2019. In the year of the internet or the time of the internet, it's difficult to avoid finding out who won. Way back in many, many years, uh, when I used to watch it as a child, of course there was no internet and although it was recorded during the summer, it wasn't broadcast until late on into the winter time, so you never knew who won. You can look up and see who won long before it's broadcast in Channel 5 now, but I didn't. And uh, I knew World's Strongest Man, and I knew 49-year-old oldest ever first winner of the darts, um, and a Scotsman, Peter Wright, born in Livingston, although he lives in England and he's lived in England for most of his life and has a very English accent, a very proud Scot. So, uh, as well as uh, Anderson and Wilson, we now have another World Darts Champion. Of course, the British Darts Organisation, the BDO's World Championships are about to start. Um, they have divorced from the Professional Darts Corporation, the PDC, and a lot of dissent there because just before it was about to start, they had to write to everybody and say we've had a fall in revenue, so the prize money we're offering is not available anymore. Is it the last time that they will meet? Will they die a, a slow lingering death and um, we will only have one darts organisation? Hopefully, uh, because I think it would help because the professional darts organisation under Matchroom has swept the board with its professionalism and its ability to make darts a very popular sport. Would that it was like that in boxing, eh? Um, Matchroom also a big player in boxing and as we have finished the year end. <coughs> Lots of look back to fights of the year, fighters of the year, rounds of the year, all of that with Ring Magazine and others. <coughs> but for me, Josh Taylor sits up the top there. Josh Taylor and Warrington I'd mentioned last week as my two fighters of the year. And I think that, again, another Scotsman who has done an amazing job is Josh Taylor. And I'm looking forward to seeing what happens in 2020 in terms of boxing, but I do think it's going to be a seminal year. We've seen the rise and rise and rise. Are we now going to see the plateau and perhaps even the fall of boxing and its popularity? I don't know. But what I do know, like the Labour Party, like the Liberal Party, that when you get to the zenith, when you get to the top, it's important you look round and you start to learn lessons rather than you assume the arrogance that you got there through your own... Um, effort alone you got there because of a combination of factors and I think boxing has to think very carefully about it. Football, yesterday at United we were up past Infernland, didn't go to the game, it wasn't a great game I hear but we won one nothing. winning ugly is important at this time of the year. From January through to Easter tends to be the time that Air United over the last few seasons under Ian McCall struggle. We'll see if under Mark Kerr that's going to be the case but one win I think in seven is not a good start, or end rather, to 2019, a start to his uh, managerial ship at Air United at Somerset Park. And finally, family, family tomb behind me. I mentioned family earlier on as this place begins to get busy. Um, I heard just before Christmas, um, in a family that we've had alcoholism, diabetes, deafness, transposition of the great arteries as part of uh, the illnesses that beset them, and my brother is suffering from Alzheimer's and is currently in the hospital down in air, which um, <clears throat> he's had it for about seven years. My brother and I are not particularly close. We've never fallen out. It's been nothing like that. Uh, but there was a gap of about five years. And during that time, um, we were not in contact. And when I did make contact with him and my sister-in-law, Catherine, um, the phone call that I received was to tell me how ill he was and he's 61 going on 62 which is very very young so that's the challenge for this year as to how that sits and what will be done um, in order to support my brother during that particular period of time if there's anything that can be done 
It's an insidious illness and even from afar looking into what it means. I had quite bizarrely a, about a year or so ago um, got in contact with the National Aphasia Association which is a similar condition um, for reasons I can't even remember why. But um, I've been reading a little um, and I'm going to be spending some time reading a lot um, to see if there's anything that I can do in support um, my own brother and, and his family and it may be that there's nothing but we'll, we'll see not the news that you want to finish one year in not the news you want to begin another in but it is the news um, and my thoughts also go out to a close friend of mine whose daughter is going through even greater difficulties who is only a year older than my youngest so I'm not standing next to a graveyard in order to bring bad news but what it does is it does bring home to you that at a time of renewal and change and looking forward that in order to get things right we often have to embrace the difficulties and look at what it is that um, we are seeking to deal with in our own homes, our own families and with our own people. So with that in mind not hopefully or overly depressing thoughts and updates to start 2020 but I'll be back next week and we'll be looking to where that's going to be but from the shadow of the Capsie Glens and St Martin's uh, with a relatively festive background it's bye from me